So, uh, going to be talking about the first one will be about why you would want to use Gradle. It's very much an introductory talk. Um, and then the second one will be something like a best practice, uh, advice for using Gradle. Because it is a very powerful tool. Uh, I and mean, powerful tools do always give you the opportunity to shoot yourself in the foot. That's one of those colloquialisms. Did we get that one? Good. Excellent. Um, okay, so me, I'm Peter Ledbrook. Uh, I've actually been working with Gradle for a very long time. Uh, I was, some of you may be familiar with the Grails web framework. I was working on that framework back version 1.1, so 1.0 to 1.1. We were considering using Gradle for Grails 1.1 instead of Gantt. Uh, and that was back when Gradle was 0.1, 0.2. So, been there for a while. It has changed a lot. Uh, it was milestone 1.0 for like a year uh, before it actually got released. Uh, some people were wondering whether it was ever going to reach 1.0. There were good reasons for why it stayed in that state for so long. Uh, and if you if you want an explanation, uh, I can give that during the break, the buffet. So to begin with, why Gradle? I want to start with a little bit of history. Uh, I always get confused because we have the word history and you have the word histoire, which is story. Which always, I always thought histoire was history. What is history, by the way, in French? En français? Histoire aussi? Historique. Historique. Merci. Um, okay, so building software, building things in this way, has been around for longer than I thought possible. Uh, it was actually the kind of concept behind it started with uh, many mechanical machines. Uh, some people have suggested like uh, some Turkish mechanical instruments were kind of the very first uh, instance case of building stuff but uh, things like looms are probably the first obvious starting point because you are effectively writing software you are telling a loom you're feeding it instructions on how to make a pattern and how to do its thing um, so programmable machines have a surprisingly long history. So this is back in late 18th century, like quite a long time ago. Uh, once upon a time, there were these rolls, lots of roll, big rolls of uh, like paper with holes in. And of course, that's not very manageable. It's like imagine doing that these days. You'd be carrying around these big rolls around your office, like feeding them into the computer. Not very viable. So then we moved on to punch cards, much easier to handle. Uh, when were the first punch cards introduced? Well, interestingly, uh, I would say it was looms again. And in fact, it was 18th century France. So uh, there was a type of loom introduced in 1801 called the Jacquard loom. And this allowed you to specify a pattern uh, as a card with holes in. And you would look, put multiple cards around to produce the final pattern for your weave. So we had these things, like beginning of 19th century, which is kind of mind-blowing for me. Um, I thought it was the 1950s, 1960s. Uh, but computers got punch cards as early as 1928. That's when IBM first introduced what we now consider to be like what a punch card was. Uh, and that was the 80 columns. So you have holes to punch into 80 columns. That is apparently why like DOS, uh, old Unix terminals and the like, are limited to 80 characters. Because that was the number of characters you could have in a punch card. I did not know that before I prepared this talk, so if you learn nothing else, you learn that tonight. Um, so these were, these were interesting. These had your program, 
of course, the order of the cards mattered, which is why people drew these things across the top. Because if you drop them on the floor, uh, oops, how do I know which order they go back into? So remember, it's angled lines. Perpendicular lines wouldn't work. Um, and of course, every time you write out one of these programs, you punch it out, you make a mistake, you've got to get a fresh card and start all over again. So life was pretty tough back then. Um, automation was introduced with effectively punch card writers. So these were typewriters that they had dedicated people. Uh, typically women, I gather. I think this was like, uh, you know, secretaries were often uh, women back then. So I don't know why it's like, guys, you should be doing this stuff as well. But um, you type out these things, reduces the number of errors. Uh, but you're still, ultimately, you're going from the program in your head into a runnable form. The punch card is your runnable form. That is what slots into the computer. Uh, Fortran and COBOL. I've actually seen Fortran. I've not used it, but I have seen Fortran. Uh, I can't believe that started with uh, punch cards. So you go from your Fortran program to a punch card. Uh, and then further automation happened with this machine. So remember when I dropped all my cards on the floor? Well, they introduced a scheme. They said, this is unreliable. We cannot have weeks of delay because somebody tripped up while they were taking their card deck to a machine. So we are going to introduce a feature which allows them to just put them in this machine and they will automatically be sorted. Uh, this is an IBM 082 sorter. So you're eliminating the human error involved with trying to put them all back together again. And the time involved, trying to save time, because time is money. Uh, eventually, magnetism saves our lives. So now we have a read-write material that's very easy to overwrite any mistakes that we make. Um, and now text editors just save what they do to the magnetic tape. And we move into the era of uh, the Pascals, the Cs, the C++'s. Uh, and we see something that's more familiar as a build process. We go from our source files, get, they get compiled with headers and all that horrible stuff that you have to remember in C, C++. Eventually going to a linker. Don't forget, every platform does something differently. Um, so this is a very, very simplified view of what it is to build C, C++ projects. And then you get either a shared library or an executable. And this is where, really, I think the first recognizable, or at least well-known build tool appeared, and that is Make. Is anyone still using Make here? A few hands. For Java? For C. Yeah, so uh, I'm amazed. It's, it's ancient, but it is still being used. Uh, typically, people use something like CMake over the top or AutoConf tools, and there are various other options. They eventually generate a make file. Um, and these, you actually have to specify the file dependencies. You know, this source file becomes this object file. Then I want to link all these object files. Uh, it was quite tedious, and of course, uh, if you've never come across the tab problem, count yourself very, very lucky. It was horrible. It's white space, but if it spaces, it breaks. It has to be a tab. Whoever, I don't know whose idea that was, uh, I don't think it's changed, it's still with us, uh, it's still a pain in the backside. I think they went on to invent Python. <laughs> invent Python of uh, what, Guido? Yeah, meaningful white space. Oh, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's actually a good point. Yes, Python, of course, um, <coughs> the structure is based on indent, but at least it doesn't matter whether it's tabs or spaces. In this case, you can't see unless you get your editor to put those little. So. Go on to Java. I'm assuming most people here are Java developers, at least some part uh, being a jug. 
And this simplified a lot of things. The compiler uh, handles the .java, the .class uh, relationships, the dependencies. So when I compile this Java file, what other Java files need to be compiled as well? However, it doesn't do a perfect job. Witness how many times do you run ant clean or maven clean or gradle clean because something's gone wrong in the Java dependency <coughs> understanding there. Uh, you've got a uniform, easy to handle module, jar format, which is the jar, um, and you, we produce, we still produce, we, in fact, we produce more types of uh, end product. Uh, applets, some people may still be doing applets, uh, war files, standalone web applications, um, all sorts of things. Okay? And so typically we think of a standard build in Java as compile, test, package, and then potentially publish or uh, create an installation which goes to CD, which you then distribute to people, or you put it on a website and people download it these days. Uh, distribution of CD, I guess, is a little bit old hat. Um, I'm feeling a bit old talking about CDs now. Uh, so that's kind of what we uh, are thinking of. Uh, one interesting question to ask is, well, actually, uh, do, do, does packaging depend on test? Should you always have to run tests just to package your stuff? Well, that's kind of a choice that you should make. That's something that should be up to you. Uh, and, you know, actually considering that history, how much has changed, what will our builds look like in five years' time? It's completely up in the air. Uh, they could be very different, they could be very similar. So, the thing we need to think about is our build tools tend to stay with us for a long time. Make and its style of build has been with us for decades. Uh, we want something, you know, you will go into companies where <coughs> their project bill has been there for at least 10 years and may still be Ant or, or, or even Make with Java. I actually started building Java with Make. Um, so you want a tool that you know can grow and adapt to like future requirements. You don't want something that is just for now. You need to be aware that requirements change. <laughs> what actually forms part of the build process changes. Um, so there are many sorts of build processes. Java build processes themselves are evolving. Uh, but one thing we do know is that you can pretty much model every build process as a model, as a graph. You can model it as a graph, typically of steps. Um, make has its targets, and has its targets. These are all steps. And eventually what you end up is a graph of steps. Any build process can be managed this way. Uh, going from producing punch cards to running those, the C projects, the Java projects. <coughs> and I'm going to show you examples of non-program like program builds as well. Uh, and this is where Gradle gets the first, the very first thing right. It works on the basis of a graph of tasks. So it's not to be confused with, uh, who, who's used Ant here? I'm expecting quite a few hands to go up. So, you will be familiar with the concept of targets, the things that you run, and tasks, which are the things that do the work, the zipping things up and that kind of thing. In Gradle, there is no distinction. A task is something that you can run. When you do Gradle compile, that is a compiled task, uh, and that is a unit of work as well. Same as a, an ant an task. Um, it's a little strange, in hindsight, it's a little strange that Ant made that distinction. There was no real reason to have targets and tasks. So you look at that, you go, great, we're going back to the days where we have to manually set up all those steps 
you know, I don't want to go back and say, I have a compile task and I have a test task. This is the source directory, blah de blah blah. blah. I remember the early days of make and ant, and it's a pain. It's just, why do I have to do this all over again? And of course, you change your mind on what directory structure you want every project. So you start from scratch again. You can't use an old build. Fortunately, Gradle takes one of the best aspects of Maven and brings it into a task-oriented tool, that of conventions. So this is, actually, the first line is just about the minimal Java build file you can have with Gradle. Uh, typically, you will want this extra information as well. So group is like the Maven group ID. Uh, version is obvious, and you typically want to specify which versions of Java you want to target at the end of the day. So what does that actually give you? If you're not familiar with Gradle, uh, this is quite handy. It will give you a compilation task for compiling your source files. It will give you one for compiling your test classes. You do not have to say where your source files are. You use the Maven convention. SRC main Java, SRC test Java. Uh, you also get a test task for running those unit tests. And you get reports generated, and you can open those up. Uh, Gradle actually comes with its own format, its own style for the test reports. Really nice. I do recommend giving that a go. Um, and by default, you get a jar task, which basically takes all the compiled classes, any resources you've defined. You can put files into SRC main resources as well. And that will go into the jar task. In fact, it pretty much does everything that Maven does for you. Okay? Just from that one line applied plugin Java. Uh, and you get a task to generate in the Java doc. Okay, so that's good. We don't have to manually set up a big build every single time. So what are the advantages of Gradle over something that already provides conventions, like Maven? Well, despite many builds having many similarities, you, a Java project almost always consists of compilation Hopefully, unit tests. You guys unit test, right? Yes. Yeah, so. um, you have the test. You package as a JAR file. Uh, but the, the only projects that I've really seen that follow the very standard process that, that like Maven sets out are the Apache library projects. Uh, Commons Lang, Commons UI, all these things. Pretty much everything else has special requirements. Um, and then you get uh, plugins to help out with those. So let's take another look at Java builds. It's not just compile test packaging now. Uh, we've got generators. There is a, a lot of mechanisms for generating source files from all sorts of things. Uh, I remember xdocrit with EJB2. Wasn't that fun? Yeah. <laughs> Um, you want to be able to uh, have, you may want special test uh, or some targets for QA. Uh, depending on the type of project, you may want some extra documentation, not just Java doc. Much more common if you're doing web applications is bundling in JavaScript, CSS, uh, trying to integrate with all the horrible JavaScript side things, the grunts and the gulps with the coffee script and the uh, SAS and LS and if you don't know what I'm talking about, again, count yourself lucky. Uh, the tools and the technologies change every three months, two months, one month. I, I think I saw a quote that's like, uh, every day there's a new JavaScript framework. Uh, so. These form a large part of projects now. 
and you want to integrate with your source control management, your subversion, your uh, Git, whatever you're using. I'm a Git fan myself. Um, all sorts of things. This is an interesting one that people may not give much consideration to. Uh, how do you get new people onto your project? How do you get them set up? Wouldn't it be great if you just gave them a build file and said, run dev setup, and that's it. You're good to go. Uh, a good way of doing that uh, is setting up, is some, using something like Vagrant, so to set up virtual machines with your development database or what have you. Otherwise, uh, you know, most places I've been, it's like, here's the wiki. <laughs> just follow these instructions, you'll be fine. And then, the, and then the guy sits there, or the, the girl sits there for like half, half the day, and then eventually comes to you and says, um, it's not working. So you end up spending the rest of the day helping them get set up. So uh, these are the types of things you actually should be thinking about automating and introducing into the uh, build. <coughs> so that's the kind of thing for a Java build. But there's all sorts of other things that you can build. Uh, this is one example, which is the Grails user guide, using a very custom uh, technology uh, based on Groovy. Uh, so you have a task to publish the guide as HTML, one to generate, convert that to PDF, uh, another one to actually fetch all the Grails source code and then generate the API documentation for it. Uh, so it is just a basic set of steps. Uh, in this case, these are optional because it takes forever to download all this source code and run the API docs across it, so you don't want to do it every time. Uh, that is very easy to do with Gradle because Gradle does not... Gradle is basically just a task-oriented build system. What the tasks are is up to you. There are some standard stuff provided by the plugins, but you can use it for absolutely anything. You can even use it for mixed language builds. So I hesitate to tell you to go back, convert all your make files to Gradle, and do the right thing, uh, because this is still incubating. Uh, there's still a lot of development on the CC++ integration. But Gradle can build C and C++ projects. Uh, they've been making a lot of the recent Gradle releases, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, have big improvements in the native code build system. Um, and mixed language builds are a particular problem because each time you go from like native to Java to like OS specific packaging, you're entering a like build barrier. Uh, and you either use like make for your C, C++ and Maven for your Java and maybe uh, a Debian packaging system for that, um, or you use make for everything. And it's, it really doesn't help. It's like if you use different build tools, every time you cross that barrier, there's the chance that the baton is going to be dropped. Something will break. That's why the ideal is to have a single build tool for the whole build process, including all the native stuff. And one thing to bear in mind, the build tool should not dictate your build process. Conventions are fine, guidelines, suggestions, but if you feel that a particular way of doing things is the right way for you, you have good reasons for it, the build tool should not get in the way. And that is another principle of Gradle. It's not there to tell you how to build your stuff. It's there to enable you to. Okay, so let's think now about what we want from our build when we're building our software. The first thing, probably the most important, 
automation. This is, we want to eliminate us from the equation. We are not good at doing repetitive stuff, except tying our shoelaces. We're good at that. We can do that without thinking, generally. Uh, sometimes I occasionally go down and I think, how do I tie my shoelaces? And then it's gone. I can't tie my shoelaces. If I don't think about it, it just happens. But you rarely do anything in your build that is that repetitive from day to day. Uh, and every manual step, every time a human is involved, you introduce fragility into the system. And of course, with fragility, you get mistakes. Mistakes cost you time and typically money as well. Um, you know, I've, I've wasted lots of time through deployment. I was involved with deploying the grails.org website. There was a lot of manual process of getting a war file I built locally to the uh, server, and then getting that running, finding it doesn't work, coming back, and it was just not good. Um, it is a time sink. Uh, and you can end up with having a long path. Uh, you know, <coughs> builds can take a long time before you find that something uh, didn't work. Uh, you find that something didn't work because you forgot to set a property like an hour ago. And that's how long the build's been going. Stress. Um, so, ask yourself this. Does your build have any manual steps? And if so, why? Think about such things as copying files around, editing files, you know, setting properties manually, uh, entering parameter values, running shell scripts. I've done that a lot. Uh, that's completely outside of the build system and is an extra potential mistake, costly mistake. Okay? So ultimately, you want everything automated. And you hear about the Netflixes of the world. They go from source code to running and deploying continuously. That's what continuous deployment means. Do you imagine there is any human uh, interaction during the build process? Well, if they're doing it every time they make changes and they want to immediately release it, any human interaction is going to mess things up regularly. You've got to have it automated. So, uh, the reason I'm talking about automation is Gradle makes it particularly easy to pull that stuff that used to be manual, all those manual steps, and bring them into the build itself. You can do it by custom tasks. Uh, when you're initially developing your Gradle builds, it's very easy just to define a new task in the build <coughs> file itself and just put the, the work that's done. Like in this case, generate some HTML from a .gdoc file. Uh, you could have uh, a compilation step in there, a one that's specific to your build process. You can very easily integrate a custom task into existing uh, task graph. So, we're assuming here that we already have a build task that builds everything. And when I build everything, I want to make sure that this happens as well. So I do build or depends on publish guide. So it's not just about it's easy to create tasks. It's easy to take those tasks and insert them into your build. <laughs> whether it's a custom one, or whether it's a Java one, or an Android one, or a CC++ one. Uh, typically, you don't want to keep this type around for very long. It's useful for initial development and trying things out, but ultimately, you want to move to a proper task class similar to the way that ant tasks are implemented. Uh, and then you just create a new class, put it under the build SRC directory, and it's available in your build. So this is actually a task instance, 
So it's something that has a name that can be run from the build. I can run Gradle Publish Guide. This is just a task type. I can't execute it until I instantiate it, in effect, using syntax similar to this. Um, you can then refactor further and put your task classes into a jar file or a, a plugin. A plugin is just a jar file. Also, don't forget, a lot of people have similar requirements to other people. Some may have already done the work for you. There's a whole plugin ecosystem. So you can go there and have a look. Um, there are, I think, at least hundreds of plugins available for doing all sorts of things. Uh, then, example, there is a shadow plugin that will create a fat executable jar for you, for your project. Um, okay, so, automation. Repeatability. Uh, this one I don't care about so much because I never hang around companies for very long, um, so it's not my problem. But companies keep their source code around for a long time, they release lots of versions, and sometimes they support old versions. What happens when a user reports a problem on an old version? You want to make sure that you can take the source code for that, build, and end up with exactly the same package as your user has. Otherwise, how are you going to reproduce the problem? Or, uh, something more contemporary is if you uh, just having that new, your new developer come along, they grab everything from uh, Git or Subversion or wherever, run the build, and it doesn't work. You don't want that either, because you're then debugging the build and trying to work out why does it not work on this fresh computer, but it works on mine? That's what you want to avoid. So ultimately, we're talking about, given the same set of inputs, we want the same outputs. Environment should not be a factor. Okay? <laughs> you can parameterize the build, but you don't want things like the uh, operating system having an impact. Or how many cores does the, opera, it, how, how does the computer have? Things like that. Or, oh, somebody set this environment variable, it broke the build. No! I don't want that. Not good. Uh, I'm going to come a, uh, across a classic example of this. Um, so, repeatability is tricky. There's a limited amount that a build tool itself can do. Because ultimately, you are dependent on like the tasks themselves. If they are influenced by the environment, what can Gradle do? Nothing. So you've got to write your tasks in a way that is environment independent. Um, but one thing that Gradle can help with, there are two things, the first of which is task ordering. So uh, I've talked about tasks depending on other tasks, uh, but there's also an idea that uh, I have an example of packaging reports. So uh, this, this actually came from a continuous integration server that would not make HTML files available to view. They said, no, there are too many artifacts. You can have five files or something available. So, but, but, but the test report is like 10, 20 files. Uh, so the suggestion was, well, package your test reports as a zip file. So that's where this comes from. So I don't, when I run package reports, I don't actually want to run uh, package reports alone, typically. Uh, but I don't want package reports to false integration tests to run or unit tests to run. I want to be able to choose which of those actually runs before you get packaging. So there is no dependency, but it is a requirement that you can't run package reports before the tests have run. 
because you've got no reports to package, obviously. So you have influence over task ordering outside of dependencies. You can say package reports must run after the tests. Yes. What does it do or should run after? <laughs> I'm going to remove that from this slide. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. It's one that doesn't have a simple answer. Must run after, should run after, in most circumstances, uh, work the same. I have to admit to not quite understand. OK. When I read about the difference, I understand it. I don't remember it afterwards, though, because it's esoteric. It's so generally, at the moment, it generally doesn't matter. Uh, there are some very specific circumstances, which I don't remember where it is different. Uh, not often. It is very small. So I won't worry about it. I would just use must run after. Unless you, if you come across an instance where you feel that, OK, I only want to give it a hint. Because that's what should run afterwards. If you can run it afterwards, then do so. But if not, well, mm, okay, don't worry about it. You can run before. Um, uh, but it's dependent on Gradle internals. It's quite an involved thing, so yeah, don't worry about it. I know it's a cop out. I'm sorry, um, but there there is no simple one for that. Um, but it, yes, it's an important question to ask. Uh, another one is uh, finalized by, so this ensures that uh, whenever I actually run integration tests, uh, package reports gets run as well. Okay, so I can say unit tests. Uh, a common one for this is uh, functional tests. You want to ensure that your test server stops after uh, you run the functional tests. If you say finalized by, Stop server will always run, even if the tests fail. Whereas normally, like a dependency, uh, or a must run after, <coughs> your functional tests fail, build stops. So finalized by is just a way of ensuring that resources are cleaned up, whether the build succeeds or fails. Okay, so the other, that's task ordering, the other uh, area that helps, that Gradle helps with, is cache, the dependency cache. So, I'm hoping I'm not the only one going to put up my hand here. Who has come across the, well, it works for me problem, <laughs> because something's lurking in your Maven cache and not somebody else's? Yep, 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 yep. It's not uncommon. Uh, so, an important part of Gradle is a much more uh, uh, robust cache. Okay? So, importantly, it remembers where it got a dependency from. So, if you suddenly run the build, uh, you, can, you can specify multiple repositories. If it suddenly picks up a dependency from a different repository, because uh, the ordering has changed or something, uh, then it recognizes that and will flag it. Um, it also ensures that you know, Gradle works in a non-ideal world. Gradle recognizes that people publish POMs that are complete rubbish. They recognize that they republish artifacts with the same version. Okay, that's allowed if it's a snapshot, but not otherwise. You know, you don't suddenly, oh, I've released 100, oh, there was a bug. 24 hours later, you go, hmm, well, I'm sure no one's downloaded 100 yet. I'll just publish the fix under that version. No. Um, so there's the check some on the binary itself to make sure that doesn't change. So uh, if you go back in history, you can ensure that the cache doesn't influence uh, whether the build works or not. Okay? Uh, you can add Maven local into your repository search. 
which is kind of a form of masochism, I think. Um, you, if, you, if you want to work with Maven builds, or you do uh, Maven install, or you can do Gradle install as well, and it will copy files into the Maven cache. It's really handy for testing something locally, but you've just made it locally dependent. You commit something, another person downloads it, can't build because they don't have that jar in the Maven cache. So generally avoid using Maven local. There are ways to get similar effects to what you want using other techniques. Okay? Now uh, you can use, you can specify a directory as a repository, which is much better approach. It's a full blown. You get uh, and it, that uses the Gradle cache, so you get those, those benefits. Um, other things you can do uh, are specify what happens with dependency resolution, because as we all know, dependency resolution, dependency management, is a little like hell on earth. Um, it's just, we don't really want to go back to pulling all the jar files off the internet, putting them in the lib directory, and then forgetting what versions they are, and then trying to upgrade them. Uh, I did that for a project recently, and I, I was reminded why dependency management is great. But there is a, a downside, there are all those conflicts. Um, the fact that you don't have modules, that the module information is in separate files, doesn't help. Um, it will be interesting to see what uh, Jigsaw with Java 9 does in that, in that respect. So you can uh, add useful uh, hints, things like this. If, uh, if you have two versions of a particular uh, library in your dependency graph, fail immediately. Don't try to guess which one is the right one. Because uh, a lot of times, guessing will just end up with something you don't want. And when do you find it out? When you're debugging the running application, or it's gone to production and, some, and the customer has complained, or something like that. And the whole point was, you did not know that there was a version change, or a version conflict. So this allows you to say, always fail. I will make time another, another version of a library gets dragged in by another transitive dependency, the usual business. Um, I want to fix it right then and there at the build time. Uh, and you can also say, like, whenever I come across a particular dependency, I want that version. I don't care whether there's a new version. I know this one works. Uh, it's not a panacea. There are still problems with this approach but it does give you some control at least. Uh, <coughs> okay, so, yeah, that's uh, talked about that. Um, very quickly, you can get really dirty uh, and change the uh, coordinates <coughs> of a dependency. You say, well, when I come across the groovy dependency, actually I want to upgrade it to groovy all. Uh, the, why you want to do that is because Conflict resolution, uh, Gradle will see gray, uh, Groovy and Groovy all as different dependencies, and you'll get both on your class path. But they both have the same classes. You really don't want that, especially if they're different versions. Because then you've got, okay, on this platform, my Groovy dependency comes first on the class path, and on this platform, my Groovy all one does. And so my application actually runs differently on two different platforms. You don't want that. Um, so that's the kind of thing you can do. It's still ugly, um, but you do at least have some control. So finally, uh, automation, reliability, efficiency. You are, you can be running builds several times a day, several tens of times. Maybe you run the build hundreds of times a day. Uh, you want to make sure that it's not hanging around. You don't want to sit there <coughs> waiting if you don't have to. So, um, again, you're a little bit uh, at the mercy of individual tasks. If a compilation takes a long time, 
it's going to take a long time. Or if a jarring takes a long time. Uh, but you can improve things by only running the tasks that need to run. This is what happens typically with compilation. You only compile the Java source files that have actually changed. So you get a much faster compilation step. Okay? So uh, Gradle introduces the concept of an incremental build. So that whole incrementalism works throughout the whole build system. And you can pick, hook into it yourself. So whenever you see up to date, that's the incremental build saying, nothing's changed, changed. I don't need to run this task again. Uh, so this is a fairly standard uh, Java one, uh, with your compilation, your jarring, no tests, oops, um, and installation of the app. But even installing the app is up to date because it knows that nothing beforehand has changed and the, uh, the zip file is already, all the files are in place for the installation, so you don't need to do that. It's not just compilation. So it's all about this up-to-date business. When you're using Gradle, you typically do it because you have some customization you need to do, you have custom steps, so you want to be able to bring those into the incremental build system. Fortunately, it's very easy, especially if you have task classes, if you write your own task class. You just add annotations to corresponding properties. So I can say, okay, I have a property here which is the artifact file, the jar file that's produced by something. It could be a jar task, typically. But it could equally be a download task that pulls a jar file from somewhere. So we say, well, that's an input file. If that changes, this task needs to run again. Uh, if the artifact URL path changes, there's a value this time, just add input. I need to run the task again. Same for this one. Um, at optional is unrelated to incremental build. Uh, there are output ones as well. In fact, for this to work properly, you at least need an at output annotation, like an output file. Typically, typically it's output file or output directory. Anything change, uh, so it will check the, the dates on everything inside an output directory and see whether it's uh, the same time or older than the input things. Okay? You can have a task that just has an output. It doesn't need inputs, but it's quite rare. Okay, so that's how you hook into incremental build and uh, bring efficiency to your build system. It's very easy, it's very quick to run a build which just does up to date, up to date, up to date. But it takes less than half a second. So remember, build should be automated, repeatable, and efficient. And that's what we want about, out of our build process, our build. Okay, and that's what Gradle helps us produce. Uh, in addition, uh, just in case you're lacking, you think it's lacking on anything else, you get a, a rich API. I'm going to talk about that more in the next presentation, but it's a, an API that helps you to model your build process, because that's what you need to do. You have a build process, you need to model it. Similar to the way that you have a business problem that you're trying to model in your software. Okay? Uh, if you've heard of domain-driven design, that underpins a lot of the way that Gradle was developed. They're very conscious of making sure that the internal model suits its application, which is modeling build processes. Uh, we've talked a little bit about dependency management. Everything that you're used to, you get, uh, plus the extras I talked about. Uh, it has all the Java ecosystem integration that most people want, uh, especially with IDEs, continuous integration servers, uh, static analysis tools, lots of other stuff. Now, if you have something specific in mind, uh, feel free to ask me during the break. Uh, publishing, very straightforward. There are actually now two different ways of doing it. Uh, 
Maven Publish is the new one that they recommend you go with. You can publish a, a Maven compatible repository, Ivy based ones. Yes, some people still use Ivy based repositories. Uh, partly because the, the metadata about an artifact is richer. The POM, a POM is actually not very, it doesn't allow you to um, give an awful lot of information, metadata about the jar file, about an artifact. So there are limitations to the POM file. Uh, or you can even publish to S3 now. Uh, I've seen talk on the dev mailing list about that. Um, and of course all the plugins that will do a lot of the work that you're already used to, uh, creating a fat jar file, uh, hooking into the static analysis tools and so on. So, uh, even outside of Gradle, to summarize, like, the whole end-to-end -end process is the build from the source files and any other resources and everything else to a running application or an installer, or whatever that final endpoint is. Every step in between is part of the build, and you should try to automate it if possible. 80-20 uh, rule, it's kind of a guess, but a lot of projects are, especially like Java projects, similar to a lot of others. You know, 80% of Java projects are, have the same sorts of things as other Java projects but about 20% of a project will be different. You know, it's very arbitrary, uh, but there is a r ratio there. You know, a large part of the build is common to other Java builds, but almost every single one has some custom requirements. Uh, remember to automate, that's what we're aiming for, save us time. Um, and something I do feel that some people just treat the build as a, another concern they don't want to worry about. They want to do absolutely minimum to it. They just want it to work, and <coughs> if somebody else can do it, that's great. Uh, considering how crucial your build is to uh, producing a reliable running system at the end of the day, you should really treat it in the same way as your application, your system. Uh, invest in it in the same way. Assuming that you actually invest in your software products and making sure that uh, people are spending time and people are writing tests. Uh, you can actually write tests for your build system. Uh, there are ways of doing that. It's useful if you are writing plugins, you can test those within a Gradle framework, uh, but actually considering what the build is doing, why not test it? Why not make sure that it's producing the right artifacts in the right locations each time that you make changes to it? It is a fluid piece of software. It changes. I'm not saying that I do that, but I think it's a good idea, like tests. Uh, and building software does require a rich model because of all those uh, different requirements. People are doing different things in different places. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, and I will take any questions if anyone has them. Otherwise, by the way, I'm going to put these slides on SlideShare. They'll also have presenter notes. Uh, so I'll have more text if you've not quite followed everything. Um, and I will tweet that. So keep an eye on at P. Ledbrook and I'll make sure that's done uh, tonight or tomorrow. Yes, Stefan? So you said that you can test the build. How do you test the build or test the build? <laughs> oh, well. Um, you, you get another Russian doll and put that on the outside. Um, yes, you know, there are limits to uh, how far you should take it, for sure. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's just like a, a test case. How do you test your test cases? There, there is a, a potential for your test case to actually be wrong. But it's less likely than the, it, it changes less than the uh, source files. Because testing the build is more like a functional or integration test. So those don't change very frequently. Uh, unless you're doing those horrible HTML-based ones. <coughs> Every time you change markup, your integration tests fail. Yeah. Any other questions?
Otherwise, break for buffet. Buffet time. Thank you.